Hello, everyone, and welcome to Norton from Home. I am Kate Faulkner, Associate Curator of Education for Public Programs at the Norton. We are coming to you live tonight for the virtual presentation, Dominic Chambers, I Came Alive, I Could Fly. Dominic Chambers' painting, A Moment in Yellow, from 2019, is currently on view through May 30th in the special exhibition, Art Finds a Way. Chambers creates large-scale paintings and drawings that reference literary narratives cited in books, various mythologies, and African-American history. Chambers received his BFA from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and his MFA from Yale University of Art. He has exhibited his work in both solo and group exhibitions regionally and internationally. Chambers has also participated in residencies, including the Yale Norfolk Summer Residency as well as the New York Studio Residency Program in Brooklyn. Throughout tonight's program, we encourage you to submit comments and questions through the chat features on YouTube and Facebook. And as usual, we will dedicate the final few minutes to answering your questions. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Dominic Chambers to the program. Thank you, Kate. I appreciate it. Thank you for the introduction. And I would like to say thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight. Um, I know that your time is really valuable to you and I appreciate you setting the time aside to listen to me speak. And before we get started, I wanna give a shout out to my professors at my hometown community college at Flow Valley. Um, and I also wanna give a shout out to my mom. She's no longer with us, but I figured if I ever give a talk at an institution that I give her a shout out. And I really think it's important to um, acknowledge those who um, let, allowed you to stand on their shoulders. And so without further ado, let's get started. So I came alive, I could fly. This title of the exhibition borrows um, from a quote by the jazz musician, Charlie Parker, and which he famously said that when he found the right harmonic progressions, on his saxophone, he could finally play what was inside of him. You know, and if you any of you are familiar with Charlie Parker, he's most famous one of the songs called Bebop. And in a way, you know, he did come alive. You know, he was able to find his relationship to the world through his music and through art and education and art history and through the acts of painting. Like that happened for me too. And I remember thinking um, about this very pointedly during a conversation with a professor of mine. Um, at Flow Valley when I would sit in his office, which I did quite a bit, I would annoy my professors kind of lurking around. And he pointed out that he saw life um, awaken in me throughout my um, studies there. And he was right. And throughout this talk, we'll see um, the ways in which I began to understand or renegotiate my relationship to the world through the study of art. Um, next slide. So we'll start with these two incredible men here um, who are influential, not just to my practice, but to life, to my life. So on my right hand side is Andre Breton, who is um, a French writer and poet and kind of the godfather of the Surrealist movement, which happened in the 1920s. And on my left is an incredible writer, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's a credit to being not the founder of, but the godfather of the magical realism magical realism literary genre. Um, wrote the book, 100 Years of Solitude, Love in the Time of Cholera, and Autumn of the Patriarch, among many others, right? And so I was introduced to these writers throughout my um, studies at, in community college. And it was fascinating because when I attended that school, I was intro introduced to a whole host of great thinkers, you know, in the our historical canon. I mean, we're thinking about people like Felix Gonzalez Torres, John Cage, I mean, Ray Johnson, Helen Frankenthaler, Agnes Martin, you know, I can go on, right? And I didn't know that artists were as critical thinkers as they were, you know, I didn't have an education in it. But through upon learning, you know, I found, I felt like I had a space to participate, finally, you know? And throughout my art history class, I came across, you know, the, you know, surrealism, because one of those things you study, and I began to understand that I was living in my own life under surreal conditions. You know, um, next slide, please. And so this idea or uh, examination of the black experience or the black character through this surrealist lens can be echoed by, you know, amazing writers such as James Baldwin, who famously said during his um, 1965 debate with William F. Buckley, 
I strongly suggest you listen to that debate. You can YouTube it if you haven't already. But he famously said that the most violent and most private thing that racism and systematic oppression has done to the black pop population is destroying its sense of reality, you know? And that was that really stood out to me. And that alongside, you know, contemporary commentators on race and politics, such as Mark Lamont Hill, who often cites racism as having the um, power to create, construct realities for other people and having them believe it was their own, you know? And so there's this examination or this acknowledgement of the surreal conditions that Black individuals inhabit or, you know, endure or negotiate. And so what I love about magical realism is that magical realism grounds that as the norm. It is the normative idea or the normative examination of a group of people's um, everyday life. And so if you take, for example, the book of Laughter and Forgetting by Milan Kundera, and my favorite book, which is The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde by Juno Diaz, they're, they utilize magical realism, not as um, the sensationalized tool, but as a kind of allegorical critique of oppression. And the book of Laughter and Forgetting, it was during Russia's um, occupation of the Czech Republic. And in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, there was an examination of how generational trauma, the character Oscar being of Dominican descent, often had to navigate um, his own uh, set of issues in, an, in the context of America, but being haunted by the trauma that happened in the Dominican Republic under the dictatorship of Trujillo. And so, next slide, please. Why leisure? You know, like I'm saying all this like really heavy and like kind of quirky shit, you know, around surrealism and the black experience. But leisure for me is oftentimes the thing I imagine black people to be doing the least. You know, and I mean, to be fair, I imagine that's the thing we all do the least, you know, and it's the thing that we deny ourselves the first, you know, first. And it really is in these moments of like stillness or like catching up with yourself or a reprieve in which you can really renegotiate your own approach to the world, especially if your experiences didn't necessarily always make the most sense to you, you know? And for me, seeing a black character or a black subject sitting down or thinking, takes me on that journey of renegotiation with one's own experience. So to the painting on the screen now, which is called The Sweetest Thing. It's um, the first painting I made after graduating from Yale. And the subject in that painting, her name is Adrian, and she's a close friend of mine it's from the Yale School of Drama. And it's part of a body of work I call the Primary Magic Series. And the reason being is because I have a deep fascination and investment in um, well, one, the history of colored field painting, but also the history of minimalist paintings as well. And I remember going to the St. Louis Art Museum and we would see like these red, blue, and yellow Ellsworth Kelly paintings. I remember seeing them around like when I was 16 years old or so and never fully understanding them, you know, without a critical lens. And they always stood out to me as just such odd objects. But upon, you know, further investigation and thinking and studying up on the history of minimalism, in colorful painting, uh, I understood that the point of colorful paintings was to exist outside of the social, outside of the political, right? Like your experience with those paintings were meant to be one of pure color, you know? And in some cases, your body was considered a medium to it, right? As it related to the image or object that you were engaging with. And so within this particular painting here, you have a figure of painting that is done predominantly in different hues of yellows. Um, next slide, please. And another painting out of the um, Primary Magic series, which is called um, Sunshine Lady. And so while I do also think about, you know, these very heavy the um, theoretical and this very critical, like complex and critical discourse around art and around history, I also think about my own personal narrative and music plays a big role in that, how I understand my work. And so the title of the painting, Sunshine Lady, comes from a song by, uh, the blues singer Lattimore. And my mother would oftentimes play the blues um, in the house when I, when I was growing up. And that always like, you know, became a way for me to like reconnect with her, you know, through music and through songs. And so that's oftentimes a role that, you know, the music plays in how I label or title the works that I'm making as a way to also referencing my personal biography, but also the subjects in my paintings, you know, they're all, 
individuals I've had some sort of relationship with, you know, either they're friends of mine or cohorts or peers. And I think about um, the relationships with color. I'm deeply invested in the history of color as well. And the, um, and the magic. And so the silhouette in that particular yellow painting is my silhouette. It's dancing in the background. And you'll see these silhouettes drift in and out of different paintings. And the reason for that being is that I think about the possibility of the surreal to be conjured through stillness, right? When you're thinking less, when you're reading more, when you're slowing down, when you're catching up with yourself, in those moments of stillness or reflection, you know, your external world can change. Next slide, please. And so that brings me to um, the painting that's on view right now at the Norton, which is called A Moment in Yellow. And the subject in this painting is a close friend of mine as well. His name is Gabriel Mills. And in this painting, there's three subjects, one of which you can't really see who's hiding behind the tree, but the subject sitting behind Gabriel is actually an imagined figure. That is Gabriel's imaginary friend. And that curtain-like motif that is on the left-hand side of the composition borrows from um, my, Peter Pan. I, I, I love fairy tales and I love um, child, childhood movies and the magic that was presented in those that um, captured my imagination growing up. But I, for those of you who are familiar with the story, Peter Pan would oftentimes come through this window and the curtains would be blowing and, and that's how you knew he was um, coming through. You know, he'd be flying in and um, coming to this child's imagination and taking, to, taking them to Neverland. And so a moment in yellow in Gabriel's painting, in Gabriel's subconscious. This, these are things that he's imagining, you know, in his stillness. Um, next slide, please. And also the red paintings. And so part of the Primary Magic series, they're constructed in red, blues, and yellows. And this is part of the, um, you know, my investigation with the color red and um, how I construct, you know, a relationship to the surreal in a much more direct way and ideas of double consciousness. And so the subjects in these paintings were friends of mine at grad school and still remain friends of mine to this day. And it's important that I not um, outline that because a lot of my paintings are made in vacuums. I'm oftentimes in consistent dialogue with someone as I make my work. And so I understand that the relationships of the individuals in the paintings are also just as, mar as, just as much a part of the process in my life as it is to the process of me making this painting. And we'll continue on. And so back to the relationships I have with um, you know, the friends of mine, I'm oftentimes uh, kind of shocked whenever um, fellow artists would tell me that once they graduated, they will lose this critique. You know, they will lose engagement with um, other artists and somehow those conversations became few and far between. Whereas I never really had that, you know, I am incredibly fortunate to have a maintained and sustained engagement with um, those around me, other artists around me. One of which is Titus Kafar. You know, he would come to my studio and we'd fuss and we'd fight and we'd debate, but he always pushed me to like, you know, make my painting stronger and, you know, to like read certain things. And I'd reach out to other artists to figure out what they were reading if I, you know, was invested in their project. And one of the books that I encountered was Marsha Hall's book, um, Color and Meaning. In that book, she broke down um, the four mo hot modes of um, painting in the high and low Renaissance, including um, Unione, Cangiantismo, Sfumato, Cur and Curascuro. And so with this painting here, I started thinking about the, uni the Unione method, which is where you strive to create harmony and balance amongst a certain um, within, within a group of colors. You know, you'd eliminate these extreme jarring contrasts. And that's what um, animated my process when I was making this work. It's particularly in the areas where there's um, various hues of pink, you know, softer reds. And also in that book, um, the color and meaning book that Marsha Hall um, wrote, she talks about this um, opportunity for the su supernatural to occur. And that would often occur through a rainbow. If you um, would consider, um, the painting by Fra Angelico called the Annunciation Angel, where this angel, the Annunciation Angel is greeting Mary, but the overall environment is painted in browns and blacks and whites and grays, very earth tone, you know, a lot of earth tones, but the wings of the angels will be painted in these, in these highly saturated rainbow like colors. And that's when the viewer knew something surreal or supernatural was occurring. And so you may not see these overt, um, 
kind of surrealist motifs or tropes in my work, but it's through the paint handling. You know, the paint is also a character or a protagonist in my images, you know. Next slide, please. And then the last set, which is the blue works. And the blue works are really important because I started thinking about the black body's relationship to the color blue. And whether it be, you know, art historically speaking, or, you know, if I was one was to consider the transatlantic slave trade, or if you were to think about the literary genre, I mean, the music genre called the blues, excuse me, or the, um, the book, The Weary Blues. And I was thinking about how can I utilize these, you know, such a specific cultural reference with um, a more critical lens through art, through art history, you know, if one was to consider something like an Eve's Climb Blue, per se, right? And this painting here is called Life is Elsewhere. And it's of my friend Max, who is a phenomenal medical um, doctor and was a medical student that I knew at Yale. And that spirit that's looming over him, that white shape is actually me looming over him. And I oftentimes think about, you know, these spirits as being uh, kind of mischievous or, a, you know, a kind of inconsequential or product of the subject's imagination, right? Like something that they're acknowledging, but they're not afraid of. You know, they, it's considered the norm in the context of their environment and in the context of their reality. Because for me, I do think of the Black experience as being inherently surreal. And so within these images, that seems to be the thing that um, is most evident, the normality of it all, this surrealism or the magical, the magical realism elements of the work. Next slide. Oh, this is um, some undergrad. Uh, this isn't undergrad. This, I did this, um, if I remember correctly, I will say during my second year at Yale. And I got really invested in this idea that light could, uh, how light affected black bodies. And in this work here, I was thinking about light having the potential to dissolve us and then recreate us as well. Because it seems that, you know, our relationships to certain bodies is oftentimes influenced by the time of day or the kind of lighting, lighting circumstances in which we encounter them. You know, if you were to encounter certain bodies at night with very little light, you might feel a degree of anxiety, particularly if they're, you know, black bodies, right? You know, we're, we have this normative cultural fear of black bodies no matter what. Right, but thinking about light as an object or light as a form that creates possibilities, you know, that can, you know, influence our subconscious or our conscious or, you know, the rational world. That was something that I was investigating in this, in this particular painting. Next slide. And another one from the um, Primary Magic series, the blue work. And again, thinking about bodies of water, bodies of water, but also thinking about geometric abstraction as well. And also the relationship that um, other art, art, other painters have had to water, such as David Hockney. If you were familiar with David Hockney's paintings, you would consider the pool paintings, which were some of you know from his more noted body of works. You know, um, but I thought about those pool paintings a lot as they pertain to you know class and wealth, because no one I knew like had a pool or an infinity pool growing up in their backyard. Right. But that seemed to be really prevalent in, you know, Hockney's works. And I wanted to, you know, have that conversation in mind as well. You know, what is what do we think about when uh, we think about class as it pertains to um, who has access to water or wealth in terms of who can monopolize water, who can control, who has, you know, clean or fresh water. And, you know, what are the implications of that for black bodies? You know, like certain black body, certain black communities still have individuals in it quite popularly who can't swim, like myself included. And so we'll move on. And so this one is called The Night is Our Friend. And I, I love this painting because I started to think more about conditions. Like I, I'm a painter that likes to think about conditions first. And that's how I kind of, you know, like the conditions or the settings within those paintings are the things that animates my approach to um, painting them. Like I consider what energy or what kind of vibe or what kind of, um, I don't know, effect or setting will be most effective for this image, but also deploying um, traditional art historical logic when it comes to various painting modes, such as chiaroscuro, which is a play of extreme darks and lights, you know, the theatrics of it all. And so <clears throat> I made this painting during um, the, the political conversations around building the wall here in the, um, of the Mexican border. And oftentimes thinking about walls as, uh, how, as they, how they pertain to our history, if you consider the Berlin Wall, for example, as these things that you know, were meant to separate from each other, 
but also pre presents an opportunity to engage or to, you know, I will say perceive a new reality on the other side of um, a community that we're trying to keep out. You know, we could forge identities in which we needed each other. And so the light in that painting functions as this sense of opportunity, you know, and it's not a completed wall. You know, it's one that is being observed and or acknowledged or presented. Um, next slide. And so I wanted to talk about um, Tim Rollins and KOS because these, this well, they're a collective and I was um, informed about them when they were brought to my attention at community college. And I remember being blown away at listening to their documentary. And Tim Rollins was a public school um, educator who had, you know, plenty of students who did not look like him. He was a white man, his students were black and brown. And he started, he introduced them to various um, literary texts, often, you know, classic American literature. One of which included, uh, I would say this one had Kafka's America, among many others. They also read um, biographies of Malcolm X. But in this particular painting, I remember seeing this work and being so blown away and when I listened to Tim Rollins talk about how this work came to be, or this entire body of work came to be, I was more, <clears throat> it, get, it grounded my experience in reality because it showed me the opportunity that literature presents. And so what Tim Rollins did was he introduced um, Kafka's America to his classroom. And he, taught, he told them to take the, the themes or the content of that book and relate it to their real world experiences. And that opened up a possibility for those kids to imagine their own worlds, right? And so in Kafka's America, which is a story of an immigrant named Carl who comes to America and believes America to be, you know, this place of great opportunity, the streets are paved with gold, you'll be embraced, quickly found out that is not how this works at all. And so through a series of misadventure, Carl almost gives up hope and he passes a plaque. And when he passes the plaque, the plaque says, come to the, um, the nature theater of Oklahoma where everyone can be an artist. And so this is happening at the last chapter of the book. And as Carl goes, he sees, he arrives at a track. And at the track, he sees these tall individuals on these ladders dressed as angels with these wings blowing these trumpets. And those trumpets were, you know, a sign of victory or glory or like, you know, the chaos that democracy presents. And what he asked the students to do was like, if you could paint your trumpet of victory, what would it look like, you know? And the product was, was this work, you know, these kids saw that and they, you know, life happened in them as well, you know, they came alive. And the trumpets, you know, started taking on all kinds of absurd shapes and the product was this incredibly beautiful um, painting. But what's interesting, the reason I bring him up, because literature plays a huge role in Tim Rollins and KOS's project, just as it does in mine. The difference being, however, I don't, keep the text from the literary um, references in my work. You know, it's not an element in my practice. Whereas in his, it's a direct um, com element, com compositional element. Um, next slide. And this is um, one of the works that I wanted to add into it because I saw this painting during the Blue Black show at the, I believe it was at the Pulitzer in St. Louis that was curated by um, Glenn Ligon. And this gives you a sense of this, like how well composed these works are done. And these are all done by students, this, this work. But this is what happens when you have um, the ability to utilize literature or reading and compose kind of like highly critical or competent compositions within a work. So I'm, which is, you know, borrowed from, I'm a man, but also the Malcolm X book. Next slide, please. And so these are subjects of mine that are reading. And, you know, I started making these um, paintings of the black subjects reading the books because I felt like I didn't really see that. And it seemed that, you know, no matter how much time I spent in an art museum, there were almost no black bodies seen reading, you know, like actual books that I didn't encounter those images quite often. And I mean, being in America, there's obvious reasons for that, you know, like black bodies weren't allowed to read books, you know, they weren't allowed to write, you know, the consequences of doing such things were very severe. And so, you know, to the painting, the subjects in the paintings now, the spirits, the red and green ones, could also be a product of the book that the subject is reading. You know, so this relation between what's fact and what's fiction, what is real and what isn't, is really important as well. Next slide. Because we're gonna see a couple of these works, along with um, some black monochromatic paintings, that also depict black bodies reading. 
Dark Skin of a Summer Shade, which is um, borrowed from Frank Ocean's song, Pink and White. So again, like thinking about music as a uh, component in the titling of my work. Um, next slide. And this is the first black monochrome I did. And of course, um, adding some nods to the red, black, and green, which was also um, an important thing in the 1920s as well. It was the color of the flag from the United Negro Improvement Association by Marcus Garvey. Um, next slide. And then I, this is another black monochrome, but this one in particular was um, a breakthrough painting for me because it was about looking. And it, I started thinking about like, you know, what does it mean for us to observe? You know, what happens for, you know, black characters when we do observe the world in moments of stillness? What do you see and what, you know, what is waiting for you? I remember um, growing up and, or staying in my sister's house um, on the north side of St. Louis. And there was this huge tension about being looking out of the window, you know, because you never knew what was waiting for you, you know. However, when there was always drama, you know, happening down the street or, you know, there were cops everywhere, my sisters and us, we were all in the window. And that was something that fascinated me. And so the subject in this painting, Africanus, who's a close friend of mine, um, this is him looking out of the window, but he's looking out of the window into this field of rainbows, right? And for it, and that rainbow is covered up by this curtain with these raindrop-like motifs on it. The raindrop-like motif um, comes from uh, earlier works of mine and tends to follow me throughout current works as well. But that raindrop motif that you're seeing throughout the images, um, it comes from this pattern that I developed when I was thinking about The Veil by W.B. Du Bois in his book, The Souls of Black Folks. And I was thinking that, you know, the veil is essentially a metaphorical curtain that separates, you know, you know, the black subject from another. And it's because, and, you know, of a multitude of reasons, it prevents them from fully experiencing or acknowledging someone in the, on the fullness of who they are, you know, due to their own preconceived biases. But we all experience those things, you know, but we don't see them. But through the lens of magical realism, we could. And for me, it was this raindrop-like motif. And I started utilizing it as a curtain or as um, a, an aesthetic element more so with an aesthetic sensibility. Um, next slide. All right. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of you may be unfamiliar with this painting, um, or at least I'm assuming that because when I bring it up, I'm often alone and talking about it. <laughs> but this painting is called London Bridge and it's by Carrie James Marshall. It's on, um, in the permanent collection at the Tate. And whenever I'm working in my studio, I oftentimes have lectures playing in the background anyway. And during uh, a conversation that Carrie James Marshall was having with the chief curator at the Tate, the curator asks him um, about the rope that's hanging above the black subject's head. Excuse me. And he asks if whether or not that rope has anything to do with racism or oppression or the history of lynchings in America, to which Carrie responds, it absolutely doesn't. You know, sometimes a rope is just a rope. You know what I mean? And it's funny because I understood why the curator asked that question, right? I mean, it is right above his head. But also it's interesting that that rope can no longer be seen outside of its historical um, implications, right? Especially as it relates to a black body. But for Carrie, that rope was purely coincidental. And if you look at the background of the painting, there are these hot air balloons that are floating in the space. And if you know anything about hot air balloons, you need a rope to pull them down. And so that's what that's why that rope is there. You know, and I just I love that conversation, right? You know, who reads what into what object, how that object functions, how we understand it, what we bring to that object. You know, I've been reading um a lot of stoic philosophy recently, you know, just because I've been struggling with like, you know, my mental health or you know, struggling with a lot of anxiety and depression. And I oftentimes return to books, you know, because it just helps me get over myself. But in Stoicism, there's this thing called what rules your ruling reason? You know, essentially, like, what is it that, you know, is filtering in your interpretations of, you know, what you're experiencing, right? What has built up your worldview so that you have certain opinions over others? You know, how are you interpreting any given situation based off, you know, your own experiences? And that's something that has to be negotiated with that rope you know, with, you know, whoever's viewing it. But anyway, on next slide, I decided to um, tackle that in my own work. And so in this, in this painting, the subject, Shai Keith, who was a close friend of mine as well, 
is meditating on that rope. And the rope is referential to the Carrie James Marshall painting, London Bridge. And that particular blue that's in this painting is called a haint blue. And this is one of the privileges of having like, you know, amazing friends who are also artists who are willing to share, you know, ideas around their work or what they're negotiating or what they're considering. And when I spoke to Shaquille, he informed me about the history of that color because he uses it quite often in his painting, in his works, in his photographs and installations. And the history of that color is that certain like Southern blacks would oftentimes utilize hang blue and paint their doors and their rooftops with it. So that when a spirit would come, you know, looming through the neighborhood, it would mistake that color for the sky. And then they, it would leave that family alone. You know, so that color became a protective color. And it was one that I found to be fitting to utilize to paint um, my friend. Um, next slide. Another blue painting, um, Elsa, a friend of mine from law school. And this is one, one thing I have to also talk about when it comes to um, my relationship to painting and my relationship to the subjects in it, is that the subjects in my paintings are all, you know, in, like friends of mine throughout certain times of my life. Then I do see my work as a timeline of my life in many ways. And so Elsa was a friend of mine and continues to be, but she went to the law school. And when I was in grad school, I got out and I ran and I met as many people as I could and built, you know, pretty solid relationships. And they were really generous with their time and willing to model for me for um, the works. Um, next slide. Oh, my God, I'm going to have to speed up when I run out of time. Um, <laughs> so I had a show at the August Wilson Center um, called Like the Shapes of Clouds on Water, which was curated by the, um, the amazing Kilolo Luckett. And I wanted to add these in here because it gives a sense of the scale of the work as well and also what they look like in a group. Next slide. And next slide. All right. And so we're transitioning to um, another body of work of mine, which is called the Wash series. And this is um, this painting I started off with is, is because this painting really impacted me. This is a painting by Morris Lewis called The Veil, you know, which I thought was fascinating that, you know, Morris Lewis was a, you know, white American artist. And what I loved about his work is that those paintings were made by just pouring paint directly onto an unstretched and unprimed surface. And what was beautiful about them is that it was a layering process. So he did create veils that allowed you to see, you know, the process where the medium and the substrate became one in that image, you know, so your experience was one of pure color and one of the object. Um, next slide. And so these are a series of works that um, I started, I will say this one I started back in about two years ago, but they were also negotiating this idea of the veil. And this time less so utilized the raindrop motif that I initially used earlier, but then considering people like Morris Lewis in the image that I showed prior or someone like Franz Klein or Robert Motherwell, or Helen Frankenthaler. But again, thinking about, you know, ways to disrupt the legibility of the image that one will be engaging with, because that is what Du Bois was getting to in his own work. Next slide. Another one in the Wash series. And continue. And we'll stop here. And so, and this is um, important. So this one is called Some, um, Some Other Place. And it's of um, two friends of mine from the Yale School of Drama, Adrian, who was in the yellow painting um, in the initial part of the earlier parts of the presentation and Chris Betts. And I know that this painting may be hard to read, you know, at first glance, but that's kind of the point, you know, like I, I never really trust anyone who wants to consume an, an object or a painting or a work of art because they understood it immediately. You know, and that has been a point of contention for myself within terms of how black bodies are being consumed in the, the contemporary art landscape is that there's this hyper legibility. But what I want to get at is that all things aren't often, you know, that legible or that well understood the first time around. You know, like your initial reactions are often very incomplete and they might require you a further investigation. You know, and so with these works here, like the abstracted qualities of them are really where the works you know, come alive. You know, that's where the works really start to happen. And we can continue and keep going. Keep going. And so here I was um, thinking about, oh, sorry, Bobby. Um, I was thinking about um, the paintings, uh, Monet's Water Lilies. And so there's two paintings that um, I started called Clouds Never Get Old. 
and then um, Step Into the Shade, which were meant to be um, part of a series of several works. Because when I went to the St. Louis Art Museum, I remember seeing a collection of um, that happened, and it hasn't happened since, of Monet's Water Lily. There were like seven or 10 of these paintings that created this beautiful panorama when you walked into the space. And the impact that those paintings had on me like cannot be overstated, you know? And I started to think about those referential with these works here. And we can continue. Lemon World. And then Saint. So Saint, it feels like yesterday, again, part of the, the wash series of works. And I made this painting because I was thinking about, you know, the art historical references around, you know, the sainthood or like, you know, the Pope or, the, you know, the spiritual, the pastor, what, what have you. But, you know, when I think about saints, you know, growing up, my mother was an evangelist and, you know, we were, I was raised Pentecostal. The saints oftentimes were black and they would, you know, come to church in these beautiful decked out suits with shades on, they would look great. But when people consider saints, they often don't consider people that look like, you know, my friend Ferrari in this painting, you know, but to me, I could be sitting here having a conversation with someone who would be a saint, you know, someone who, you know, visits you. And next slide. And so the stacking of the book. And so it's funny, like growing up is just so weird, man, because one of the reasons that I got so many books underneath my belt wasn't like by choice. I was always like kind of in proximity to a library, you know, like even... <laughs> I, I, even when we were homeless and I had to go spend time at the St. Louis Public Library downtown, like that wasn't by choice. You know, I don't even remember um, like ending up there. It's a funny story, like when your parents keep things from you. Because when we ended up having to stay downtown and sleeping in parks, my mother never told me that was what was going to happen. You know, we just kind of showed up there like it was a secret and she had something to show me, <laughs> you know. But anyway, as it pertains to like, you know, it was great because it allowed me an opportunity to really spend a lot of time in that library downtown. And I started thinking about this idea of um, upward mobility and the, the fact that black individuals have had, you know, have been crippled by the, um, the lack of access, access to knowledge, right? From the moment we got here, we were crippled from that. But when you consider books like um, How to Win Friends and Influence People like Dale Carnegie or, you know, Quiet, The Power of Introverts, but, in a world that can't stop talking by Susan Cain, you understand that there's numerous um, kind of like personality, like tr traits or types that are privileged in society that allows you to self-consciously be more successful than not, right? But it always starts with, you know, knowledge, right? The idea of like reading or acquiring, um, you know, building your human capital through, through literature, you know, but the wash that's over those paintings prevents us from fully understanding those those books or having access to them. So that's what those that painting was meant to do or to negotiate. But again, I often have, you know, different people in my head in conversation when I'm making a work just to have, you know, to bounce ideas off of. And one friend actually considered this painting to be a self-portrait. Um, I'm fascinated by that and I don't know where that'll go, but it's an interesting proposition. We continue moving forward. And this work here was um, called Gabriel's Resting Place. But I want to talk about this quite briefly because it talks, um, it's great for examining um, the way my personal narrative has started to influence the way I think about my, the own, my motifs in my own practice. And so the rope that I initially was um, referencing Carrie James Marshall by, I started thinking about my grandmother. So my mother, my, my family is from Osceola, Arkansas. And my grandmother was born in, on the later half of the 20s in this shack, and she would often tell stories about how she would see these lynching trees of these ropes, you know, and oftentimes the ropes would still be there even after the bodies were taken down. And I was thinking about how Du Bois said that when his son passed away, he passed through the veil. And so in this work, that rope-like motif that changes into the branch with those that's embellished with the veil-like raindrops, that's what I was thinking about. You know, that's where that symbol or that shape comes from. Next slide. And we're going to speed up. We can keep going. The Remembrance Curtain. Yeah. And now, okay. And so I add these in because I know, you know, we're winding down with the lecture here. And I add this image in because this is where I was working all of five years ago. You know, I was living, I, both my parents were gone. I was, I had graduated from undergrad, 
but I didn't get into grad school. And I was working in this tiny little closet that was probably no more of a nine foot by seven feet. But I felt the necessity to keep working, right? I wanted to keep you know, my work fresh. I wanted to generate my ideas. I was obsessed and enchanted by the world of art. I didn't want to give it up. And so I put this in for anyone who you know, is watching Instagram or looking at social media and they get caught up in these products, you know, but they don't necessarily see you know, the process that leads to you know, the place that I think I am right now. And so I put that in just to you know, let people know, just keep working, keep moving, you'll be fine. Next slide. And so after Albers, so Joseph Albers, the modernist painter, um, you know, most famous for you know, the homage to the Square series that he started in the 50s, but was more um, impactful around his theories around color. And so his, in his book, The Interactions of Color, he, the, um, Albers theorizes that when you orient two colors next to one another, they have the ability to change or influence one another, right? And for me, I found that there was a beautiful symmetry between those colors and you know, our identities. You know. Uh, next slide. And so if you consider this painting here, which is called a day by day thing, my friend Chibuke, my friend Gabriel Mills, and Danielle de Jesus, all of which are black. Chibuke, however, is Nigerian, Gabriel um, American, and um, Danielle is um, Puerto Rican. But I started thinking about how in certain social paradigms your identity seems to change. Chibuke, being Nigerian, came from a very different social paradigm around blackness before, you know, that for him offered a bit of confusion coming here to the States, where someone like Gabriel, due to his fair skin, despite being black, if you were to take him to a place like South Africa, they would almost label him as white because they're not concerned so much with your genetics and they're more concerned with, you know, your phenotypes. And that oftentimes influences, you know, the way your body is being read. Or if you go anywhere into like, you know, other Spanish speaking countries or islands, you understand that like, you know, the history of like the transatlantic slave trade impacted, you know, the genetics of the people that inhabit those spaces as well. And so in a sense, you have your body, your identity, and the con and the, the context in which it founds that filters into your identity and how, you know, you relate to a, any given society. Next slide. Another one, again, the LA sunset. Oh, we keep going. Max, again, so you'll see that certain subjects repeat throughout my work. And that's because I do maintain a sustained relationship to you know, the subjects in my painting. Adrian, again, and keep going. And we'll close with this one here. And this is um, Africanus. And this is another After Hour series. But again, thinking about um, color relationships and how I can create space. And so with this particular painting, I remember working at the Kemper Art Museum um, about four years ago, three or four years ago. And I was there at these Dutch landscape paintings. And when I looked at this particular um, composition, when I was laying it out, I wanted to see if I could think about the space or the, um, the kind of romantic, the romanticness of it all within those landscapes, within that image. And so it, cre it created a, a chance for me to try out different painting approaches as well. And you know, we're running a little bit over. So if Kate would like to join me back on screen here, I would love to take any of your questions if you have any. But I would also like to say that I hope that you've gained a sense of knowledge from this talk, that it was beneficial to you, and that you kind of get a sense of through like my studies and my investigation with paint, art history, and literature, like how it's impacted my own relationship to the world and the problems that you know I'm currently negotiating. So thanks. Thank you so much, Dominic. Yeah. Um, that was a really illuminating presentation of your work, and I really appreciate you sharing. Um, all of the ideas that you consider and negotiate, which may or may not uh, enter into your work. Mm. Um, and it's also interesting to hear about a lot of your personal history. So thank you so much. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Um, Kathy asked, do you think of subject or color first, or does the subject matter lead to your color choices? Oh, I often think about color first. For me, I oftentimes think about color and mostly because I think that in my current practice right now, I'm really just very invested in it. Like I'm really in love with color. And I just wanna see what I can do with it. You know, I'm not necessarily like the best painter in the world. And so I, I, for me, it's an ongoing practice, right? Like I have to get things right constant. And I love, the, I love the process, you know? I love the revision of it all and trying to see, you know, how I can get certain things to work. 
And so that kind of influences like my prompt more than anything else. And color ideas come from everywhere. Like I'll be in New York and I'll look at construction workers working. And I'll think about the, you know, the intensity of their green hoodies, you know, and that might influence, you know, my approach for like a painting or thinking about the way sunlight might affect my arm if I'm like sitting in a car or the way sunlight affects a building. And those things oftentimes um, are a great jump offs for my work. Great. Thank you. And then Sarah made the comment, um, I see your paintings as very fluid with transparencies and all of them in a harmonious color palette. Beautiful. Mm. And then um, I had a question. I, I was just curious um, how your studio practice kind of evolved during quarantine uh, when everything kind of slowed down. Did it give you time to investigate new ideas um, just when everything was kind of forced to slow down a little bit? Um, I would say, yeah, it did. I mean, the After Albert series started um, during quarantine and it was because like things did slow down. I could finally, you know, write out what I was thinking or at least try different approaches and just seeing like, you know, what certain paintings looked like and whether or not they were going to be successful wasn't a huge deal to me because you weren't going to shows anyway. You know what I mean? And so I could just play around with those paintings and see, you know, what the possibilities, you know, were. Right. Yeah. Um, and then something you said in your presentation kind of struck me when you mentioned that paint handling in some of your, maybe from a past series was you considered a character in your work. Yeah. That was a really interesting point. Could you expand on that idea a little bit? Yeah. And so for like whenever I'm painting, um, you know, whenever I'm making a painting, like the color in the painting really is a protagonist too. You know, it has to have a life, you know, and it has to be able to function or at least amplify your experience of engaging with that body. You know, especially if you're considering a body, you know, remaining stationary in moments of um, leisure or doing nothing. And it's that, you know, it's a, most of my images are in some ways kind of mundane, right? But the illustrious, the illustrious, illustrious, illustrative listness, ill, <laughs> ill, it comes from the color, you know, in my investigation in color. And so for me, when I'm, I'm approaching a painting, I want to make sure that the color is just as alive as the subject is, you know? And for me, that's a huge point of, um, I don't know, what I'm exploring. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I do Great. consider the color to be a character. You yeah, know? I love that idea. Well, thank you so much, Dominic. This was just absolutely fabulous. And um, I just want to really say that it's a pleasure hearing from you and learning more about your work and all of the artistic influences that you think about when, when you're creating your pieces. So. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Cool, thank you. And thanks all of you for joining us again tonight for this virtual presentation from Norton from Home. Uh, on Thursday, June 3rd, we are hosting our next virtual program, Decoded Messages with Home Sung, who is the curator of East Asian art at the Cincinnati Art Museum. This talk will explore the historical background and symbolism behind the Chinese depiction of phoenixes and eagles, the two birds featured in the Norton's installation, King of Birds. You can find more information about this event and all of our upcoming Norton from Home programs at norton.org. Thanks for joining us and have a great night.